Okay, so let's talk about cognition. What the heck is it? Why are we talking about the way people think? That's silly. Why would we do that? All right. So I mentioned on Thursday that cognitive psychology is about the study of the mind. But we didn't really talk about the mind and what it is. So I have a question for you. <laughs> See, this is where we're, we're going to engage chat right away. What are the ways that the word mind is used in everyday conversation? What do you think? What are the ways in which just what, what phrases just drop those in chat right now? What phrases are uh, are used uh, or where is is the word mind used in them? I'm losing my mind. Mm hmm. Yep. Are you out of your mind? Do you mind? Mind control. Sound mind and body. Mind blown. I don't mind. Mind your business. Mind your business. Yeah, I like the mind blown. Everyone's talking about mind blown. Don't mind me. Peace of mind. I don't, don't mind if I do. <laughs> Have you lost your mind? Closed minded or open minded? There you go. <laughs> oh, mind if I do. Yoink. Yeah. So, the interesting thing about all of these is that um, they all have different meanings, don't they? And yet they use the same word. I find that incredibly interesting from a ling linguistic standpoint, uh, which we'll talk about language later in the semester. Great minds think alike. Yes. I, I, I'm i fascinated by how, um, how lazy <laughs> we are when it comes to reusing words and then that the meaning in the phrases that... Um, that uh, get changed, that change the nature of the word. I think that's that's I think that's amazing. Um, but of course, we are going to talk about it. The way that a cognitive psychologist would. And so there's a few of them in there that I like. So mind control, mind blown, uh, closed or open minded, great minds. Okay, these reflect the closest definition. So the use of those phrases reflects the closest definition to what a psychologist would use. Okay, and the definition of the mind that I want to use in this class is this is the conceptual instantiation. That is the conceptual being of the brain's biochemical mechanisms. That's a lot of words, Dr. Swan. That's a lot of big words, Dr. Swan. Yeah, so your mind is a conceptual idea. So it's abstract. And that is what cognitive psychologists study. They study this abstraction. Okay. It's the favorite word of a cognitive psychologist, and it is the study of the cognitions in mind. That's what cognitive psychology is. Okay. So let's define what it means to be a cognition. Cognitions are processes where sensory input is transformed. This is order of operations here. It's transformed. It is then reduced. 
It is then elaborated. It is then stored. And if it's stored, then you can recover it. And then once you recover it, you can use it. And what do I mean by it? Well, information, whatever the sensory input is. Energy. Okay. So, vision. This is light energy. Hearing. This is sound pressure energy, right? Sound levels, sound waves, right? Minute pressure differences. Is it my skin? Then it's mechanical energy. So all sorts of things. Set, uh, tasting and smelling are chemicals. Is it chemical energy? All of this is sensory input. Okay. So let's go through each of these. I want to talk about transform first. And I have a few demos here and there. Uh, and then we will round out this by talking about um, how psychology came to include Cognitive psychology, so the broad study of psychology and this subdiscipline of cognitive psychology. So a little, so this is um, the conceptual basis for cognition, and then we'll talk about the historical basis for cognitive psychology. All right, so transforming information. I never remember to get rid of that transition from the side. So dumb. It's very dumb. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> All right, so transforming information. This is where external sensory information gets changed into something that your brain can use, okay? So I'm just going to take vision just because it's we're going to talk about it a little bit more than any of the other senses in this class, um, especially when we talk about perception. Um, what, on Thursday, I think, is when we start perception. So I'm just going to talk about vision because it's easier. So anyways, vision is um, the result of light energy. Bing, bang, 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 right? The reason the, the, the reason you can see me on your, your laptop screen or your computer screen or whatever it is uh, is because your, your um, screen is producing light, right? That light is hitting your eyeballs in various ways, and then you can interpret it. We'll get to the interpretation part later. This is just transforming. So we can't actually use light energy directly. We have to change it into something um, that is biological in nature. Photons are not biological. They're a base property of physics, right? They're a base property of the universe. We need something that is biological in nature. And so that energy is converted, that light energy is converted into uh, things like biochemical energy. Okay, biochemical energy. What is biochemical energy? Well, uh, different chemicals react to different things. So in our eyes, in our eyeballs, in our retinas, we have photopigments that react to light they be, they they turn change a different shape that sets off a chain reaction which is the flow of ions in and out of axons okay so that's biochemical um bioelectric energy that bioelectric energy is used by our brain okay so it's the transformation of light energy those photons the wavelengths of light are then converted to bioelectrical energy and biochemical energy, okay? In that case, that cascades from our eyes into our brains, and hey, we can see. Hooray! Okay, so here's a bit of a demonstration, okay? This is not going to really all th work all that well on, uh, well, maybe, it maybe it'll work on this. I usually just do this on a screen, so I, I don't really know how this is going to work. Okay, so we're going to do a mental transformation. Uh, in pair one, which circle is bigger, A or B? You should be really quick at, at answering this question. <laughs> <laughs> and in pair two, which one is bigger, A or C? Just a bunch of... Drop an A in chat. <laughs> so... This demonstration doesn't really work uh, in the way I 
want it to because I would preferably like to um, time you. But what what happens in this demonstration is that if people are presented with pair one, they are very quick to answer that A is the bigger circle. But if presented with pair two, they are actually significantly slower. Now, we're not talking about seconds slower. We're talking about milliseconds slower. And that is because the light energy from these four circles is hitting our retinas in um, similar ways. Okay. Uh, and when a when the circles of A and B hit our retina, not as many, not as many uh, photoreceptors are impacted, like literally impacted by photons, as they are with A. So A has a bunch of receptors impacted. B doesn't have that many. But when we look at pair two, A and C, we have similar amounts, similar amounts, not the same amounts, similar amounts of photoreceptors impacted. Okay. So here you have a situation where now you have to compare and you become a little bit slower, milliseconds slower, but observationally slower, demonstrably slower, significantly slower. Okay. So that's transformation. When we get the information from the circles, however, we have to make the transformation of energy. It's not because it fell on our eyes and we made the decisions because of our eyes. It has to do with our eyes transmitting the information to our occipital cortex and having our visual cortex interpret the size of the, um, the circles on our retinas. So it's not the retina directly, it is the interpretation of the information on the retina, okay? So it's a, it's a subtle difference there. I want you to be aware of the subtle difference because the transformation is what has occurred, not the actual light energy on the retinas themselves, okay? Uh, hey, Merrick. <clears throat> and this particular demonstration is called the symbolic distance effect. Um, the closer the two things are in physical size or or something what we'll call distance, um, the harder it is to distinguish the two. So that's what the symbolic distance. You don't need to know the symbolic distance effect for this. I just I'm just explaining the what researchers were using it for. OK. All right. So again, transformation is the, on a cognitive level, on a cognitive level, is the transformation of the physical stimulation of our eyes, not necessarily the light information, okay? Now, I go into more, way more detail about this in, in sensation and perception, but suffice to say, uh, the transformation is not the same as sensation. And we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, on Thursday when we start our perception chapter because perception is not the same as sensation. Okay, And that's due to transformation. All right. Alrighty, so the next one was reducing information. Reduce. Reduce, reuse, recycle.
So we have to reduce information. The problem with the world is that there's too much stimulation. Okay. So there's a great scene in um, The Man of Steel, the um, Henry Cavill Superman movie from 2013, I think is when it came out. Anyways, um, when young Clark, young Clark Kent is um, discovering for the first time his ability to his abilities to hear very quiet things. So his super hearing, um, his X-ray vision. So his uh, his oh, I don't so super vision. <laughs> um, Puber is now here. Welcome to the party. Uh, and it's all coming to him as like he's like having some sort of um, uh, psychotic break, and he runs into the. Uh, closet and he's like holding his ears shut and he's closing his eyes because he doesn't know how to control it and his mom comes because she knows that he's a super right he she she knows that he's an alien and she's like you just need to make the world smaller make your world smaller oh it's such a heartwarming scene because it, it's useful uh for lots of things um, to reduce sort of worldly anxiety. But anyways, make your world smaller. And he does, and he's able to then control it and so on and so forth, and then the Superman, right? <laughs> the, the rest is history. Uh, but it, it, it is what your brain does. There is so... You are bombarded with all of the light information. You're bombarded with all of the sound information. You're bombarded with all of this information, and so you have to reduce it. And how do you reduce it? Well, we're going to talk about that um, when we get to attention. OK, when we get to attention and how that interacts with memory. OK, we uh, reduce events to their crucial elements to know the gist. OK, all we need in life is to know the gist. Yes, these PowerPoints are on Brightspace. You can, um, they generally speaking, will be up a day before the uh, class. Uh, so if you want to follow along, you can download them. So we reduce events to their um, gist, whether that's in real time using attention or that's in uh, a thing of the past. Uh, which is which would be the interaction of attention and memory, or at least the recall of information from memory. We'll get we'll come back to the the recall the um, retrieve in 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 a little bit. Um, but I have a demonstration for this one. Okay, I have a reduction uh, demonstration for this. So no cheating. Do not look at a penny. Do not um, look at uh, just drop in chat what you think the answer is. Okay, look carefully at these coins. And which one is the real penny? Which one is the real penny? No looking up pennies. Okay, I'll put you all out of your misery. It's a... We didn't do super great, group. Although you were putting in the effort to re-examine. The answer is A. Let me... I'll go back. I'll go back. Let's look at it just a little bit more. So we have In God We Trust at the top. He's facing to the right. We have Liberty next to his name. And then we have the year the coin was minted in, um, like, at his lapel area, I guess, is what we'll, we'll call it. <laughs> Carrie, are you saying we as chat suck or just Americans suck because we, we spend more money to make a penny than it's worth? Because I think we suck could go for either one. To be honest with you, um, but yeah, uh, some people get uh, caught up on whether or not the the mint is on here, but of course, none of these show the mint location. So you'll see an S or a D. So San Francisco, Denver, where the the mints are that make 
uh, pennies or whatever. But yeah, one cent. So this is why I isn't uh, isn't right because one cent is on the side with what's on the other side of the penny. Does anybody know? Now you can look up a penny. <laughs> America. <laughs> oh, good times. I have some pennies upstairs. What's on the other side of the penny? Okay. So in the original task, uh, so this has been um, this has been uh, a, a staple in reducing information since 1979. Uh, 85% of college under undergraduates. So don't feel bad. 85. You did actually a little bit better than the average here. You did a little bit better than the average. Oh, we have uh, one cent in the White House Lincoln Memorial. Uh oh, going back and forth. Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. I'll let you. Uh, I'll let you all noodle on that one. So don't feel bad um, that if you didn't guess a that you got it wrong um, because who cares about pennies? Get rid of the penny. Get rid of the penny. Get rid of the penny. <laughs> yes, it is the Lincoln Memorial. You can see him sitting inside of it. Indeed. All right. Moving on to the third one. We have to elaborate information once we reduce it we actually have to unreduce it uh, in a in a way that makes sense, okay? And I'll tell you why this makes sense uh, because we already have knowledge, okay? And so we when we come when we come across new information, we have to we reduce it, but then we have to connect it to the everything else that we know. So that's really what elaboration is, okay? And when we connect it to everything we know. We actually changed the way the original thing is featured. We actually changed the original way that the um, information came in as. Okay. So that's what elaboration does. It changes the way by, by virtue of making connections. In terms of memory, we can call these reconstructions of the previously acquired information. Okay, so that is elaboration. And we'll be doing a, well, quite a bit more elaboration. I don't have a specific demonstration on this one. So we are just going to move on here to storing and recovering. I'm combining these because they are related. They are related processes. So this specifically is memory. This specifically is memory. So we're going to we're going to talk about when we get to memory how memory is stored that is where and how you keep it and then recovering information is where and how you get it back the things that you've stored where do you get it back one of the ways in which we forget is by not being able to retrieve things it's there but we've we haven't uh, been able to retrieve this. And I mentioned I don't know if I uh, mentioned this in class, but um, because I'm sort of having it's already like the it's like the end of the quote unquote first week. We're like sort of in week two now, and I'm already conflating things that I'm talking about. I really need to stop teaching cog cognitive psych and human memory in the same classroom because it all just sorts of sort of bleeds together. But my point is this. Um, You've probably seen Inside Out, right? You've probably seen Inside Out, the Pixar movie. Um, and if you think back to it, you see that in Riley's brain, there are these giant shelves upon shelves of curvy, of curvy shelves um, that have these memory orbs in them. Okay. Um, and they just store all of these memories, right? They just store all of these memories. And every once in a while, the glial cells, <laughs> which I like to call them, the, the, the memory helpers, uh, the memory helpers 
will send information up to headquarters and play it. Like the Triple Dent Gum song. Triple Dent Gum will make you smile. Uh, now that's going to be stuck in your head all day. Love it. Uh, so the other thing you'll notice from that movie is the when Riley forgets something, it goes down into a deep, dark chasm in her brain of which there is no escape. Which is really existential when you think about it. But that is forgetting. At least that's one way that uh, researchers have conceptualized what it means to forget. Not being able to um, remember something. Um, La Rochefoucauld, Rochefoucauld uh, in 1678 wrote, and then it was republished in 1871, wrote, How is it that our memory is good enough to retain the least triviality that happens to us and yet not good enough to recollect how we have often, uh, how often we have told it to the same person? Okay. So I want you to think of the best piece of trivia. The best piece of trivia and drop that in chat. Merrick says railroads are four feet, eight and a half inches wide because that's the width of two horses. Huh. I mean, that's useful. Uh, cicadas die after three hours of being born. <laughs> Those dummies. Those loud dummies. Wayne Gretzky and his brother have the most goals combined as brothers in the NHL. Yeah, that that knowing that factoid is probably not going to be helpful. His brother only had two goals. <laughs> Cleopatra was very uh, was actually very ugly, unlike how movies portray her. Fair enough. Although I, I would think there's some use to having that knowledge. Pepsi comes from the word dyspepsia, and Pepsi was used to cure upset, upset stomachs. <laughs> That's too good. That's good. I like that one. All of you are giving me um, fodder for the next time that I need um, trivia. Uh, Emma, a duel between three people is called a truel. Oh. Womp, womp, womp. <laughs> There's always a spider 10 feet away. Robert, why would you say that? Probably true. I'm in the basement. Brazil produces the most coffee in the world. I mean, and there's there's something to be said about that one, Alice. And I think that's useful, especially if you're going to get into e economics of coffee. <laughs> J is the only letter not in the periodic table. That's probably true. Stupid J. You will always have room for dessert. When your brain senses the glucose, your brain tells your stomach to expand and make room for dessert. Fair enough. Although sometimes I feel pretty full for dessert. But I guess that could be a learned thing than anything else. Quarter of all your bones are located in your feet. I I can dig that. Yeah. What about your hands? Oreos are mostly vegan. Well, if they're mostly vegan, are they actually vegan? Uh, Costa Rica has no army. <laughs> let's go. Let's go right now. No, they did that in the eighties. Snapple facts. Yeah, Robert. True. Uh, Stephanie knows how to make a mummy. Ooh. Um, don't die in front of, of Stephanie. She will take out your organs and put them into... Uh, <laughs> to put them into um, formaldehyde. And then wrap you up. Nobody actually knows what a dinosaur sounds like. This is very true. People just made up what they sound like uh, without ever hearing them. Yes, that is true. And um, you hear uh, if you if you watch behind the scenes stuff of like for Jurassic Park and you listen to how um, Steven Spielberg decided on what a T-Rex would sound like. Um, 
it's actually really fascinating what they combined, like lions and something else or whatever. Um, for the raptors, they were like, well, these raptors were probably bird-like, and so let's have them chitter. And so that's why they chitter in the movie. And like the um, Diphilophagus, uh, the one that goes and shoots out uh, venom. Also, Twitter's like a uh, chitters like a a bird of some court, so, some sort. John, when John Wilkes Booth shot Lincoln, he broke his ankle when he jumped. Yeah, because he's a dumbass. And he was like, oh, I'm going to jump off the balcony. Who jumps off a balcony? Idiot. Canadians say sorry so much that a law was passed in 2009 declaring that an apology can't be used as evidence of admission of guilt. <laughs> That's too funny. <laughs> oh, my God. They use a lot of walrus sounds, Duke? Okay, yeah. I mean, that, that makes sense. All different kinds of animals. They should have just used, like, the uh, Komodo dragons, the sounds that they make. Maybe they don't make sounds. I know that it's a law somewhere that all pickles must bounce. Well, pickles are the uh, food of devils, so if they bounce, they can bounce right out of my life. And I know there's probably going to be a flood of like pro pickle stuff in chat. I'm just going to ignore it. I'm just going to ignore it. Okay. Uh, too many exclamation points, Emily. Shush, Siri. Nobody asked you. Oh look, we have a um, we have a uh, somebody who should be in school right now. This is my son Ollie. If you are not familiar with him, okay. I thanks. Okay, bye, dude. Yeah, I don't know why you didn't want to say anything. How old are you? Six. And are you in the first grade? In the first grade. Started yesterday. In Georgia, it is illegal to carry an ice cream cone in your back pocket if it is a Sunday. What? That is so dumb. What, what law? Who decided this was a law? Who invested the amount of time into that? That is... I, I want to cry. That makes me want to cry. All right. You need it? Okay. I need this. He stole one of my... Stole one of my... Um, flashlights. All right. Moving on. So those were some great facts, everyone. Um, I would imagine some of those facts are... Much easier to remember... Than your... Eighth birthday. We'll just call it an eighth birthday. Last one is using. Using. You got to use it or lose it. Okay. Using uh, information. Okay. Use it or lose it. So a couple of examples. Remembering an exam is coming up. Or forgetting to buy the birthday present we had planned to buy. The planning and the remembering of something that's happening in the future is... Perspective thinking, okay? Uh, comprehending what people say to us, language. In trying to answer the question, do they grow coffee in Paraguay? We say to ourselves, well, they grow coffee. They grow coffee in Brazil, number one exporter, number one grower, as said by somebody. I, I, I missed, uh, I missed something. Uh, and Paraguay is next to Brazil, so they probably grow coffee in Paraguay. And that's what would be what's, what we would call inductive reasoning. So that is a higher order cognition that we'll talk about at the end of the semester. But I think it's interesting to note that um, uh, this is the kind of thing that if you were to be on who wants to be a millionaire, this is what you would say. Right? This is what you would do. This is what the producers would coach you to do. They would be like, okay, so when you're on there and you're like, oh, I'm thinking about a question and I'm thinking about multiple choice, 
how do I do this? Well, you would just you would just talk out loud like that. Right? You would reason like that out loud. Makes for great compelling television. It allows people to it allows people to yell at the screen and be like, "No! Don't do it, you idiot." Okay, let me know if there are any questions on or cash cab, yeah. Exactly. Uh, let me know if there are any questions on the features of cognition, the processes that we'll be talking about throughout the semester. Um, in chat, if you have a question. Okay. Otherwise, we are going to pivot here to um, a brief history, and then we'll end. A brief history. So the early years in uh, psychology and cognitive psychology, though not yet named cognitive psychology. It was actually um, a school of thought called structuralism, okay? Uh, and so one of the earliest scientists who called himself a psychologist is Donders. So he was a German. Most experimental psychology began in Germany, okay? Uh, he was, oh, sorry, Dutch he did a lot of his work in Germany, though, but he was actually from the Netherlands. Um, he was one of the first people to use a study that counted reaction time. So uh, not a stopwatch per se, but like a, an old an old timey stopwatch uh, in uh, 1868 that would would a, that would be able to measure milliseconds. Uh, that a normal, you know, ticking clock wouldn't be able to measure. Okay. And in his write up of this reaction time research, he f he he literally said that he was using reaction time as a means to measure thinking time. So 1868, the first person to use the, the first uh, before this, we don't actually have any records. So people before this could have done it, but there's no record of it. Um, and this, of course, is also a Western way of thinking. Okay, so there, we, I don't have any information about um, Eastern studies on reaction time. Wundt, who is um, most regarded as the founder of experimental psychology so and and the reason why is because he specifically named a lab a, a psycho a, a psychology lab okay and what he studied was that structuralism idea okay so he he studied the idea uh, and and so structuralism was way it was a way of 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 the and of them structuralists believed of dissecting the mind into component pieces. Again, I use the word dissecting, but mind is a conceptual idea, so I'm not literally cutting into the brain. I'm just saying, okay, let's reduce the mind down to its smallest components, its structure, hence the name structuralism, and the method that he used to uh, determine the structure was to use analytic introspection, analytic introspection. Okay, um, and that is to introspect. That is to think about your own thinking. It's it's not very scientific, actually. Uh, even though some American psychologists who studied with Wundt tried to make it so, it's it, thinking about your own thinking in even an analytic way isn't going to work. It's not. It's just not going to work. Okay. Excuse me. Excuse me. Ebbinghaus, we'll talk a little bit about him uh, in more detail when we get to memory, but he was one of the first folks to actually do experiments that were um, scientific, for lack of a better word, uh, op um, objective, at least in his own mind, they were objective and they're somewhat objective. Uh, there's a little bit of bias associated with them because he was his only 
subject. And so there's definitely bias in being your own subject uh, of your own experiments. But um, his memory experiments are quite famous and, and we would be remiss if we didn't talk about them. So we will. Um, so that is uh, that is the early. Excuse you. Sorry. Went too far. And then um, William James. William James. He was a Harvard psychologist. Um, he was mostly just a writer, though. He was more philosophical than anything else. So he was a Harvard psychologist. He decided, OK, this is what the mind is. Uh, and he wrote postulate postulate postulations there we go of his own experiences and so some of the some of the themes that appeared in his mind were things like automatic thinking or automatic behavior uh, other things like um, the beginning of the idea of an unconscious mind okay and we we still talk about his stuff today uh, I'll throw him I'll throw him in certain places here and there but most of the time, um, and he didn't do any experiments, by the way. So he's not like Ebbinghaus or Donders in this case. Uh, he, he he basically wrote things and um, theorized about him by making lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of assumptions. Moving along. Um, so here now we are in the 20th century and, um, a, and, and especially in the United States, a theme started developing among psychologists, and that was that the mind was really irrelevant from a scientific perspective because it could not be observed directly. And so behaviorists were pretty adamant about saying we don't need to study it because psychology is about behavior. And so in the United States, there was a period of, 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 of a good 50 plus year period where the vast majority of psychologists in the United States and somewhat in Europe, but not really. Europe was doing its own thing at this point. But in the United States, the vast majority of psychologists were behaviorists. And so we had people like John, uh, John Watson, um, who was mostly famous be in the early part of the 20th century, the first couple of decades of the 20th century. Um, he flat out said that uh, observable behavior was the only thing worth studying in psychology. And he um, used classical conditioning techniques that were um, that were proffered by Pavlov. And you may be familiar with Pavlov. Uh, and then came B.F. Skinner, who was like, nah, maybe not classical conditioning. Maybe it's more like uh, operant conditioning. And he was at his the height of his powers between the 1930s and 1960s, and specifically in the 1940s and 50s because once the 1960s occurred all bets are off the world changed and that is because in the 1950s and maybe a little bit before that in the 1940s computers came about we have we now have computers in the world and so behaviorism started to wane beginning in the 1960s OK, because when people started thinking about computers and how the way the computers work. Psychologists were like, wait. Maybe. Maybe that's what a brain is. Maybe a brain is a computer. That'd be kind of nice, right? And so thus begins the cognitive quote unquote revolution. It actually doesn't fit the bill of an actual revolution, um, which is something that I go into way more detail in in the history of psychology. It's not really a cognitive. It's not really a a, a revolution. Uh, and it's more of like a, a, a cognitive awakening. Maybe we should call it an awakening from now on. I'll get right on that. So, 
and some groundbreaking studies helped usher in this awakening. So we have Cherry's early 1950s study where he used dichotic listening to measure attentional changes. Okay. Dichotic listening is having a pair of headphones. Okay. So I have my headphones. And what we what we'll do in a dichotic listening task is we'll present a message to one ear and then we'll present a different message to the other ear, right? So dichotic listening, as opposed to something right now where I would like um where I would have the same message going or the same sounds going to both ears, like stereo, right? So dichotic listening is two different messages. And then you tell the person, okay. I want you to listen to the left ear and I want you to shadow it. Shadowing means I'm going to repeat everything I hear. But while I while you're doing that, a different message is going to play in the other ear. And so what this is going to do is it's going to tell me whether or not um, you can actually like attend to both ears at the same time the answer is maybe not okay you get some information from the ear that you're not attending to while shadowing the ear that you're supposed to be shadowing but you're not you don't get all of the information okay uh broadbent added to this in the late 1950s and he created uh, a flow of attention based on Cherry's and his dichotic listening task. So he created a flow chart. And I'll show you um, the flow chart from, from Atkinson and Schifrin. Okay. We have these flow charts or these process models is what they're called. These process models indicating to you what is happening inside the mind, okay? And so in the 1960s, Atkinson and Schifrin developed a processing model for memory, which is by far the most common model uh, of, of human memory, and it has serious lasting power. Like, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty significant. Uh, it's not a 100% great explanation for human memory, but it's pretty good. And that's because it relies on the metaphor that our brain is computer. Our brain is not a computer. Um, and even, even if we want to think our brain is a computer, it may be, it may resemble a computer, but it's definitely not a computer. Um, it does computations, but... <laughs> Artificial computers, artificial CPUs can run circles around us for computations, right? So the uh, information and blah, 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 blah. the information processing model, um, relying on the fact that the brain is a computer, sort of shot all of these uh, folks into relative stardom, okay, and then it just grew from there, okay. Uh, in 1956, at a conference, I think at MIT, yeah, Dartmouth and MIT, uh, so in New England, because uh, Dartmouth is in Dartmouth, Ham uh, New Hampshire, and, and MIT is in Boston, uh, artificial intelligence is coined by computer scientists. But guess who else was at this conference? Psychologists who are interested in the mind and this metaphor of the brain is like a computer. Artificial intelligence, of course, it, you know, AI, is the idea that um, we could potentially develop a computer system that has intelligence as defined like human intelligence. So far, we haven't gotten there yet, but we are using the AI moniker so the name AI is used. We haven't yet figured out what human intelligence is. So there's no way that we're ever going to figure out what um, artificial intelligence is until we we do the human part. But that's coined. And then in 1967, uh, Nieser, 
guy guy by the name of Nieser, who called who then started calling so- himself a cognitive psychologist, wrote a textbook about all of these methods that have that have come out in the last two decades, along with the Dartmouth and MIT computer science conferences. And then going all the way back to the late 1870s, 80s, and 90s, and the experiments they were doing out in Germany, and he coined the phrase cognitive psychology in 1967. So cognitive psychology as a subdiscipline is relatively young. Relatively young. But it's pretty damn good. Okay? And so let's end with... A, uh, a little bit of methodology in cognitive psychology uh, and then a lot of what you'll see um, in that method as far as describing it. So one of the things that you're going to hear a lot about this semester, and maybe this speaks to um, the grapevine uh, and uh, the sentiment that the class is difficult. Is that because we're going to be making a lot of inferences. A lot of studies are inferences. Okay. Um, Because the mind is unobservable. And so we need to create proxies for that. And we need to create very good operational definitions for those proxies. So we don't end up with bad conclusions. Okay. So we are making inferences. So we do that by... Start with what is known. So what what theories or assumptions do we know about the world? Welcome to the party, Waldo's Eye. We ask questions. So our research questions. We design experiments and come up with hypotheses that test those uh, questions. Okay. And then we obtain and we uh, interpret the results. And those Though that interpretation is the making of inferences, the inferences. So we have to infer through indirect logic what is going on in the in the mind. Okay, we we can combine the mind with the brain and talk about cognitive neuroscience. But in this class, we're only talking about the inferences that we make about what the mind is doing, what the mind is doing, okay? And then we use those results to base new research questions, new theories, confirm theories, reject theories, new research questions, new experiments, new studies. What else can we find out about cognitive psychology and then lastly um we can the models that we make on our inferences can then connect the brain and the mind because in all actuality they are connected the mind is a emergent property of the connections of the brain that's what the mind is um from a monistic monism perspective as opposed to a dualistic or dualism perspective. The mind is the brain. And so the inferences that we created from the previous slide need to then be modeled. And so you end up with structural models this is a model of the brain of of a brain. I have a physical model that you may have seen. Uh, I'll probably bring in the physical model every once in a while. Um, I have to make sure I bring it to campus tomorrow. Um, and then uh, this is this is a mess. Is what this is. No, this is our visual system. <laughs> it's pretty crazy, right? That's our visual system. It's awful. But you can see that it, it so many different kinds of connections. And then the other thing that we'll, we're actually going to see way more of in this class are process models. Process models link different processes. And these processes are boxes. And the boxes 
represent abstractions, okay? They represent abstractions, not physical locations in the brain. They are abstractions of processes, and the arrows represent the flow to these various processes. So actually, this one right here, by the way, this one right here, this one is the Atkinson and Schifrin information processing model of memory. We'll go, we'll, I'll, you'll see this again, most definitely, you'll see this again. Um, but the three components of their memory model and the flow of information from the world into the bind for processing. All right, so that is going to be it.